Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The eastern half of the Mediterranean between Italy on the European side and Libya on the African one and the Asian shore is one of the cradles of human civilization and thereby also a fighting arena from time immemorial. Its ancient empires declined and emerged in new national forms and in recent years engaged in conflict and cooperation centered on the rich resources deep under the waters. To explore this issue and Israel's interests and concerns, our panel includes from central Israel, Dr. Eran Lerman, who is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and a lecturer at Shalem College in Jerusalem. Welcome. Thank you. Also joining our panel from another location in central Israel is Dr. Chaitan Konya Narochak, who is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University and uh, uh, fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for the Strategy and Security as well. Shalom. Thank you, Shalom. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst here with me in the studio, uh, Mr. Emil Oren, and immediately dive into today's topic. Give us a broader understanding on the latest developments pertaining to this uh, uh, dispute that is increasingly rising uh, with uh, regard to the tensions surrounding the offshore maritime agreements between Greece and Turkey primarily, of course. So we are talking uh, about the area um, basically between the two uh, Tripolis, Lebanon's northern city, port city of Tripoli, and Libya's, uh, having the same uh, name, uh, Tripoli. And there are two problems uh, here. One is uh, in the water or above the surface, and that is the many islands and islets um, uh, which the Mediterranean is famous for and uh, which uh, causes a problem uh, in the uh, law of the sea, whether uh, these islands are eligible only for a 12-mile uh, zone around them or um, do they qualify for uh, a full uh, exclusive economic zone, which is uh, 200 nautical miles, uh, a huge difference. Uh, this is the first problem. The other problem is what is below the seabed, the rich resources. And here too, there is uh, another problem. The trend for oil and gas is now downward. Uh, what used to be a major industry is now in decline, uh, at least in comparison to other knowledge-based uh, industries. And the dispute uh, that you are referring to is mostly between Turkey and Egypt regarding the maritime uh, boundaries and between uh, uh, Turkey and Greece regarding the islands and whether Turkey can leapfrog over these islands uh, and uh, share its border with Libya, which is a huge uh, leap of imagination, and thereby uh, Greek and uh, Turkish emissaries um, are supposed to have ongoing talks on settling this dispute. Israel right now is an observer, but obviously because of its ties with uh, Egypt, Italy, uh, Greece and Cyprus, or at least the Greek part, Greece part of Cyprus, Israel is in a position of uh, being adversarial to Turkey. Not to forget, of course, also the, the dispute surrounding the fact that Cyprus is part of the European Union and the European Union as a whole is now backing also uh, Greece and, and the other countries involved Let in this. Let me mention that Cyprus and Greece are part of Indeed. the European Indeed. Union, Turkey and Greece part of NATO, and there is also a minor dispute between Israel and Lebanon regarding their boundaries, but this is probably going to be dealt with on another occasion. Plenty of complexities indeed. Dr. Leoman, I'd like to uh, refer to you the next question. As uh, uh, part of uh, the long list of distinguished positions that you held, one of them was as the deputy uh, 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 head of the National Security Council of Israel, uh, during which you also had the opportunity to deal with uh, multiple uh, uh, meetings vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the Eastern Mediterranean, offshore uh, maritime uh, uh, discussions, uh, exclusive economic zone uh, disputes with other nations. How do you see Israel embroiled in all this situation when, uh, even though it's on the sidelines, it is 
directly impacted both on the economic as well as on the security levels uh, with regard to the current dispute uh, in this territory? Well, um, first of all, we are not on the sidelines. We are uh, members of good standing in the um, strategic alignment. It's not a formal alliance, but it's a strategic alignment that today includes France, Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates. Um, Italy, um, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority are also members of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, which was established early in uh, 2019, but they are less, uh, let's say, less active as, as participants in this struggle. We uh, have a major role to play, even if it's not necessarily a military role. Now, our motivations here are, uh, or can be broken into two unequal pieces. As uh, Amir has already uh, said very clearly and cogently, uh, the uh, energy dimension in itself is in question because uh, the, the bottom has dropped under the oil and gas markets. Uh, but sometimes, to quote a famous saying about that Henry Kissinger said once there about uh, why are academic disputes, uh, power struggles in the academic life so vicious, he says it's because the prices are so um, uh, tiny. So even when the price, the, the, the results, the price uh, of gas and oil in the Eastern Mediterranean right now doesn't look very inviting, it is nevertheless uh, a, an element, I would say even a symbolic element, in a larger struggle. And the larger struggle is for regional hegemony. And uh, Turkey, uh, and I would of course uh, defer to uh, high on, on methods of uh, Erdogan policy, but um, Turkey basically decided to break the EMGF, it, it came to see the EMGF as a regional organization directed against Turkish interests, and as such, um, something that they wanted very much to uh, uh, basically weaken and, if possible, destroy. And this uh, leap of faith, uh, that, uh, or leap of imagination, uh, under which uh, the island of Crete has no economic zone, etc., etc., and Turkey can draw a line that connects the Turkish EEZ uh, with the Libyan EEZ, is above all designed to bottle up Cyprus, Egypt, and Israel, three countries which are viewed as hostile or problematic or enemy uh, countries by the uh, present leadership in Ankara. This was not always the case, but it is certainly the case now, that they look upon the three of us as, as rivals and, and, and even enemies, to bottle them up so we cannot bring our uh, uh, product by pipeline or power line over to European markets. It's not so much about Turkish economic interests, there easily can be found a solution that would give the Turks and us um, a, uh, a common ground. It is about hegemony. It's about dominating the region. It's about breaking the EMGF mm -hmm. as an alignment. Dr. Konya Nawochak, your uh, perceived view on this? Uh, well, uh, from my perspective, Turkey is trying to find uh, even uh, some new creative solutions in order to overcome uh, its uh, crucial problems with Greece. For instance, according to the Turkish press, uh, I do see that the, the Turks, the Turkish intelligence is trying to uh, launch a new rapprochement with the, with the Egyptian, uh, with the Egyptian intelligence in order to have a new deal. And uh, the Turks, the Turkish administration is trying to persuade the Egyptians in case that they are going to sign a new uh, maritime delimitation treaty with, uh, with Turkey. So they will acquire more uh, maritime territory uh, from Greece. Uh, from my understanding, this is um, this will not uh, going to happen, uh, given the fact that Mr. Erdogan is uh, uh, already launched a delimit a, a delegitimization uh, campaign against uh, 
Egypt's uh, Abdel Fattah El Sisi. So uh, the Turks are trying to uh, so the Turks are trying to uh, drag the Greeks uh, to uh, let me say uh, to a better uh, to to a to a more comfortable place uh, that they can uh, defend uh, their uh, uh, their perspective. Uh, that's why uh, nowadays we are witnessing that the Turkish administration uh, is trying to utilize uh, its NATO membership, and uh, it, it, they are trying to turn NATO into a, a, a neutral arbiter between uh, Greece and Turkey. Uh, Turkey would like to uh, avoid going to um, the International Court of Justice because they they know really well that uh, the international law uh, is uh, basically backing the Greek uh, the Greek uh, version uh, of this uh, of this story and uh, that's why they are trying to uh, find a solution on bilateral terms and uh, that's why they are pressuring Greece uh, with their fleet and the name of the policy, uh, the name of the Turkish policy is the brinkmanship. Well, uh, Mr. Oren, as uh, was mentioned uh, earlier by you, um, both Greece and Turkey are both allies basically through the uh, North Atlantic Treaty, NATO. Uh, but at the same time, they uh, seemingly are ratcheting up rhetoric towards one another. Uh, another NATO member is uh, a big part of this story. Of course, France is uh, uh, also uh, on the side of Greece. It has sent also uh, some uh, frigates, some uh, uh, aerial support to Greece in order to establish some maneuver. And, and training exercises by NATO uh, auspices at a time of uh, dispute with another NATO member in order to deter that NATO member. So there are all kind of uh, uh, techniques being used here which uh, uh, cross a little bit or, or uh, render uh, international law and, and alliances a little bit uh, uh, in a uh, 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 grim light, if you will. But at the same time, when you really look at the situation, it seems to be escalating. Also, uh, with regard to uh, Libya, for instance, which is uh, a vital centerpiece in the chess game of this uh, arena, where unless uh, the Tripoli government of national accord under uh, uh, President uh, Saraj, uh, if they don't survive in the battle there, it means that that uh, EZ agreement or, or uh, uh, the agreement between Libya and Turkey would be null and void in the eyes of the international community. And the opposing force in Libya is actually supporting Egypt, is supporting Greece and would probably uh, corner off uh, the, the other side. It would corner off Turkey from the rest of the region and would basically oust it from the Eastern Mediterranean. So are we expecting to see an escalation now also in Libya? Also, we see the UN reports with uh, a lot of weapons flooding in, the Irini operation of the uh, European Union uh, the, that uh, uh, is mandated under UN Security Council Resolution 1970 is seemingly ineffective, something, of course, that Josep Borrell, the EU foreign policy chief, has confessed to uh, in a meeting with his uh, Egyptian counterpart, Samir Shoukri. Where is everything heading to? So um, let us uh, uh, spend a moment uh, talking about navies. Um, you know, in the uh, British tradition, the navy is the senior service. In uh, the Israeli armed forces, it's the other way around. The, the uh, air force and the ground forces are more senior. And uh, the uh, Navy is uh, supposed to um, uh, let Israel survive during a long war by uh, helping it uh, import whatever it needs for its uh, civilian population, uh, petroleum, and uh, other essential resources, and now also protecting the uh, gas derricks and uh, the other equipment. And um, uh, ironically enough, um, only the French, the Italians, and the British used to rule the waves in the Mediterranean. And the Americans went in in 1946 under the pretext of sending uh, a battleship to take the uh, coffin of the Turkish ambassador, Ertegun, uh, who died on post in Washington. Um, his, uh, his sons 
created Atlantic records, but this is beside the point. And when this battleship got to the Middle East, to the Mediterranean, it stayed there and thus started the Sixth Fleet. And the Sixth Fleet was supposed to block the Soviet uh, squadron uh, if it moves through from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean, it had to counter it. Now, the Russians are back in the game. As you mentioned, the Russians are in Libya too. Now, of course, uh, people can transport by air whatever is needed, troops, uh, weapons, what have you. But the Israeli Navy is keeping watch, for instance, on the smuggling of weapons from Libya through Egypt to the Gaza Strip. This is one danger that Israel is always aware of because it can easily get to Hamas or to some jihadi organization and endanger Israel. So the Israeli Navy all of a sudden finds itself in a more central position than it ever was in. And the Turks who used to block its participation in NATO exercises are now involved in other disputes with the Austrians and others, uh, every uh, year or so, Erdogan finds another victim for his rage. So Israel is off the hook for, for a while. But NATO uh, definitely sees Israel as an asset. Indeed. Dr. Lehrman? Well, um, the, the, I think the most, one of the most significant changes that we've seen since the beginning of 2020 is, uh, has to do with the level of French commitment. Um, for complex reasons that have to do with uh, Egyptian stability, the balance of power in Libya, interests in the Gulf where the United Arab Emirates are very strongly supportive of the Egyptian and Greek position in the Eastern Mediterranean because they dis uh, heartily dislike the brother, Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan, and the Turkish support for the Ikhwan. For all of these reasons, or proactively supportive because they have also sent uh, uh, significant amounts of uh, weaponry and, and more so also has conducted joint exercises with Greece uh, uh, not and, far from uh, Turkish and the uh, military. Yeah. So we are looking at the emergence of a remarkable, as I said, alignment that goes from Paris to Abu Dhabi and back. Uh, with its core right now of interest right now in the Eastern Mediterranean, with Israel uh, certainly part of this grouping. Uh, but the French position has, uh, has been manifested in interventions in Libya and attempts to, by the way, in, impose the uh, arms embargo on the uh, GNA, on the Saraj government, um, with a problem because the Turks challenged uh, the French ship. They tried to stop uh, the uh, the shipment of, of arms. Uh, the French are now talking openly about creating a base of the air force in Cyprus. That's unprecedented. The British, of course, have a base in Akrotiri and Akalia, but they, uh, this has been the case since independence. But uh, for the French to come to Cyprus basically signals that France will no longer tolerate uh, the uh, Turkish bid for hegemony. We saw this with the French, Egyptian, UAE, Greek uh, exercises. And also, indirectly, this is also the reason why Macron has taken upon himself to reform the structure of Lebanon. Uh, in his two visits, he is signaling that France would take the lead because otherwise there's a reason to fear or worry that Turkey would, would do so. And indeed, uh, uh, the, a day after his first visit, uh, a very senior Turkish delegation uh, came to Beirut. So uh, th this is what they call in, in sports sometimes, you know, one-on-one -on, -one on the entire pitch. Um, uh, everywhere where you see the, the t Turks surging, the French are there on the other side of the, uh, of the balance. This is creating a very new, important new dynamic. Uh, Israel has not been so close to France on strategic terms since the 1950s, and um, and this is uh, or early 60s, and it could generate very interesting developments. Indeed, uh, Dr. Konya Rochak, uh, speaking about uh, the Lebanese uh, uh, involvement in this whole uh, 
uh, situation. Uh, it seems that on the day that uh, uh, the U.S. envoy for Syria, James Jeffrey, visited Turkey in order to communicate about the situation in Syria, in which he said that the United States and uh, 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 Turkey are closely aligned in all that pertains to Syria, uh, at the same time, suddenly now we hear uh, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo saying that the United States is aligned with France on all that pertains to Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And also beyond that, uh, there seems that there is also an alignment with regard to Cyprus. Uh, the United States approved mm -hmm. under uh, uh, President Donald Trump, uh, approved also by the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, to start and uh, lift the arms embargo on Cyprus something mm -hmm. that Defense mm -hmm. Minister Hulusi Akar in <clears throat> Turkey said would cause conflict and strife in the region. And yes. uh, as uh, Dr. Lerman also stated now, uh, the French are establishing a, an air force base there, something that the Turks are very concerned about and uh, contradicts completely their own national security interests uh, in their perceived understanding of the situation. So how do you see all of this developing sure. from the Turkish perspective? Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to emphasize that uh, the Tur from the Turkish point of view, uh, they see that a United States position vis-a-vis -vis Turkey is an ambivalent one, meaning uh, in Libya and in Syria, as you already mentioned, the uh, United States is favoring Turkey because at the end of the day, the Turkish uh, involvement in these uh, areas is also challenging Russia. But uh, when we are looking in uh, other uh, regions like Lebanon or uh, Cyprus, we are seeing that uh, United States uh, support is not an automatic one. And uh, in these areas, we are seeing that uh, Washington is skeptical about Turkish position and uh, they are not supporting Turkey. And on contrary, uh, they are also confronting Turkey. Uh, from the Turkish point of view, uh, United States um, appears uh, to be a, a new national security threat. When you're looking at the uh, surveys, the annual surveys of University of Kadir Has uh, in, uh, in Istanbul, you're going to see that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, four years consecutively, United States uh, together with Israel, uh, you know, United States is the first and the Israel is the second country. Uh, they are uh, categorized as the most important national security threat uh, against Turkey. And, and according to the Turkish press, nowadays United States launched a new strategy of uh, laying a siege uh, against Turkey. Uh, they are saying that the French, uh, the British uh, uh, and the United States are trying to uh, lay a, a siege um, uh, around Turkey. For instance, they are saying that uh, recently United States integrated a new army based in uh, the city of Alexandropoli uh, next to the uh, Turkish uh, Greek border. Uh, they are saying that uh, United States is uh, launching some uh, new reinforcements uh, to the region. Uh, the French is sending its aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle, as already Dr. Lerman mentioned, uh, we are witnessing to a growing uh, penetration of French uh, in uh, the island of Cyprus. So uh, there is a, you know, there is a very famous Turkish uh, byword. The, the Turk has no friends other than the Turks. Uh, at last, Mr. Erdogan, with his uh, antagonist uh, foreign policy, uh, he succeeded um, to <laughs> to prove that uh, to prove that the Turks have no friends other than the Turks. Uh, and this is, from my perspective, a very unfortunate. Uh, new law for the Turkish foreign policy because let us uh, let us not forget uh, how the Turkish uh, precious loneliness uh, is the way they, they are saying it how uh, their loneliness is get, is being deepened each year by year uh, during the uh, 2010 uh, we witnessed that uh, Turkey was a very uh, Turkey had a very good image in the European Union uh, and uh, during the years, starting with the Gezi Park protests uh, and later uh, reached to a climax with this uh, failed coup attempt, Turkey uh, is uh, basically challenging uh, its neighbors, uh, going into um, verbal challenges against the uh, non-Muslim countries. And uh, we can understand that Mr. Erdogan, by adopting this uh, rallying around the flag strategy, uh, he's trying to divert the attention of the public uh, from economic matters uh, to uh, 
nationalist and religious matters like, for instance, Hagia Sophia or the uh, recent tension uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Indeed. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you the opportunity to have a closing statement. Uh, Mr. Olin, we'll start with you. Uh, from the Israeli point of view, um, there is no basis in reality for Erdogan's self-fulfilling paranoia. Uh, Israel saw Turkey along with Jordan as the two major allies in the region in the 1990s when Mubarak still ruled Egypt and Egypt was cooler in its uh, relations with uh, Israel. And it was only under Erdogan that Israel reluctantly moved from the uh, Turkish uh, pole to the um, uh, Greek one. And of course, 10 years ago, we had the Marmara incident and we may have yet another naval clash if um, Erdogan insists on seeing Israel as an enemy. Indeed, Dr. Lerman? Um, very quickly, uh, there are ways of bringing Turkish uh, ambitions, or, to, or uh, to be more specific, Erdogan's fantasies uh, in check. Uh, one is uh, he has a very weak point in the economy, and if the United States is, uh, take, would take a, a more firm and, and coherent position, and I, I agree with the definition that it is currently uh, taking an ambivalent policy, uh, Jim Jeffrey on one side and others, uh, certainly Congress on the other, uh, if the U.S. takes a firm position, uh, it could uh, bring about uh, uh, greater stability in the Eastern Mediterranean and an end to some of these provocations. Dr. Cohen, the second point is... And one more line, and in Libya, the Egyptians proved that if you draw a clear red line, you can hold it. Indeed. Just the, the, the shirt Jeffrey line is holding. Correct. Dr. And, Dr. Uh, one sentence? Yes, sure. Uh, Turkey is strengthening its navy. Uh, as a country uh, which is behaving like an island, Israel should also strengthen its navy immediately. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Konya Nochak, Mr. Uh, Dr. Leran Lerman, and Mr. Amir Oren as well. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.